I did give the tour bug talk as a trainee, and it was almost exactly 10 years ago, not quite to the day, five days off, October 30th, but that's pretty close. So I'm going to give you an update of one of the things, or a couple of the things I've been working on since then. Uh, so just an overview of what my lab works on. We're basically trying to create this pipeline for treating complex common inherited diseases like autoimmunity and heart disease. Uh, and the idea is to be able to generate personalized treatments that can uh, treat specific genotypes that result in high risk of these diseases. But the problem is most of these variants that contribute to these complex gene types are non-coding. And we really don't know how they work. And we don't have the data needed to learn how they work. So a lot of what my lab is doing is trying to generate the data, to generate the machine learning models, to understand how these variants work so that we can actually design treatments. So we do a bunch of different things in the lab. I'm going to talk uh, mostly about one, but a tiny little bit about some of the machine learning stuff we're doing right now. This is pretty exciting, and there's a preprint that should be updated soon. So we held this dream challenge in the summer of 2022, and the idea here was to uh, see how we can create the best deep learning model that predicts gene expression from DNA sequence. Uh, we used some yeast reporter assay data that I'm actually not going to have a chance to talk about for this, but the, the gist of it is that using this system, you can generate like a human, human genome worth of DNA in yeast uh, in this reporter assay, which gives you a huge amount of power to learn very complex models. And so we thought this was a good system to see how to make the best possible models. Uh, we held the competition, a lot of people participated. Uh, the previous state-of-the-art model was had its uh, rear handed to it, uh, which was good. That was the objective of the challenge. Uh, and we have since shown that uh, kind of the whole reason for having this challenge is not because we want better yeast model, we actually want better human models. And uh, very shortly, we will update this treatment that will now show that the best models that we made from this challenge are actually human models. Too. So that's a pretty exciting development. But I'm not going to get to talk any more about that today. The next, uh, we're going to talk more about uh, evolution of gene regulation, although this also uses a lot of machine learning. So uh, these are the people who actually did the work here. So it was primarily done by a graduate student in the lab, Ishika Lupa, and a research associate, Cassandra Jensen. She did the yeast work uh, with help from a undergraduate student, Amelia Chen, and two graduate students, Aspar Latif Saladin and uh, Abdul Mujahim Rafi. So kind of, we're, we're gonna think about how selection works for a bit. So it's, it's pretty well known, and I think uncontroversial, that a lot of the variation in genome sequences is non-functional. It's mutations in the genome that occur, and they're no, neither good no, nor bad. They're approximately neutral, and they drift neutrally. This is like Chimera's uh, neutral theory of evolution. I also think it's fairly un uncontroversial that a lot of the phenotypes that one could measure about an organism are also not under selection. So for instance, the ability to raise one eyebrow is not really going to affect whether you starve to death or are eaten by a tiger. But in the functional genomics community, we kind of have this tendency to attribute function to anything we see the genome doing. So uh, and this is not to point any fingers. This is something that I have been guilty of too. And there's really uh, it's kind of obvious why this happens. We named it functional genomics. Function is in the name. It's kind of implying that what we are seeing is some sort of function. So the question we're going to ask today is how much of the stuff that genomes do is not actually uh, a function? So uh, 
through my work and since then the work of others, I think it's pretty well established that random DNA uh, can have activity, regulatory activity. So uh, we showed this in yeast by cloning random DNA into a reporter system and showed that it encoded for diverse expression and you could use it to train deep learning models that predict expression from sequence and even worked in predicting uh, genomic sequences because the same rules are used regardless of whether it's random DNA or human DNA. Since then, uh, people have uh, put random DNA in humans and shown you can do the same kind of experiment there. They've also put random DNA into a fly enhancer assay and showed that the random DNA encodes for specific and reproducible developmental programs. So it seems like across all these systems, this random DNA is having activity, but all of this is in reporter systems. So if you were going to see any activity, this is where you would see it. These are designed to show any activity that the sequences have. So the question is, how much biochemical activity would you see if you just had an entire chromosome of random DNA? We're going to try to answer that today. And this is important in our understanding of how much of the things we see the genome do are actually functional. So there's been ongoing controversy in the field about uh, the fraction of the genome that's functional. There was this uh, famous uh, ENCODE paper that claimed that 80% 80 80 of the genome had some sort of biochemical function. Now, biochemical function is not really a well-described term, but what people usually mean by function is that the sequence is important. If you mutate the sequence, it will affect the fitness of the organism. And population genetics people have uh, shown in many ways over the years that the amount, the percent of the genome that's functional is less than 25%, usually it's less than 10%, depending on the estimate, but definitely not 80%. And uh, this really is epitomized by the link RNA field, where depending on who you ask, there's between like tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of these link RNAs, they're long, they're non-coding, they're RNA polymerase two transcripts, so they look like mRNAs, but don't have a coding sequence in them, and they're expressed at very low levels usually in cell type specific ways. So there's some like EXIST, which is responsible for X chromosome inactivation that clearly have a very important role, but what about the other 100,000? Are they also very important? They're just uncharacterized or are they simply biochemical ones? So Sean Eddy in 2013, in the wake of this ENCODE controversy, uh, wrote in this uh, rebuttal piece to it, suppose we put a few million bases of entirely random synthetic DNA into a human cell and do an ENCODE project on it. Will it be reproducibly transcribed into mRNA-like transcripts, reproducibly bound by DNA binding proteins, and reproducibly wrapped around hit zones marked by specific chromatin modifications? I think yes. So we're going to try to answer that question today, at least to the best of our abilities. We're making this draft random encode for both yeast and human. Uh, and I'll go into exactly what we're doing for each in a second. Uh, but the basic idea is to compare uh, genomic DNA and what's happening in the genome to what's happening in naive DNA. So it's DNA that does not evolve in that organism. In yeast, we're going to use these yeast artificial chromosomes as a source for the naive DNA. These were used extensively in sequencing the human genome. They contain, uh, depending on the construct, about a megabase of human DNA. Conveniently for us, it's already in yeast. Uh, so human yeast, to, to orient you, these are, were both eukaryotes. But we're very distantly related. A billion years of evolution separates us. There are conserved TF mechanisms, but very few conserved transcription factors. And the gene regulatory structure is also quite different, with even the core promoters of yeast and human being quite different. So then we needed to get some yaks. And uh, so Cassandra called up Steve Scherer's lab, who did a lot of the chromosome 7 sequencing for the human genome uh, project. And amazingly, they still had 30-year-old yaks in their freezers, and they could send us some of them, which saved us a ton of time, because we weren't about 
to clone their own yaks. Sure. So here's what we did. Uh, we had two yaks. We actually had 10, and at the request of a reviewer, we did a second one. But at first, we only did one, and I'm actually only going to show the results from one today because the second shows basically the same thing. We performed uh, string specific poly A plus RNA -C. So these are mRNA like transcripts we're going to look at. Align them to a hybrid yeast human uh, genome. And then once all the data has been processed, we only at the very end separate where it came from. So that it's a very apples to apples comparison, whether it came from the human or whether it came from the yeast. So here's what the data looked like. Now, if I didn't tell you which one was which, you probably wouldn't be able to predict, at least with a close inspection, whether the top or the bottom was the human DNA yeast. They look quite similar to each other. They look very extensively transcribed. And here the transcription is shown in the red and blue, with the transcripts of the walkie structure. So they're both have extremely transcribed. If you look at human promoters, uh, of course, the yeast promoters in yeast are acting as promoters in yeast. That's exactly what you expect. The human promoters in yeast are not acting as promoters. In yeast. So it's not like the yeast is interpreting the DNA in the same way that the human is. It's interpreting it in a yeasty way. Some of the transcripts are also spliced. They don't use the canonical human splicing motifs. This is an example of a transcript that's sliced. It's actually using the canonical yeast splicing motifs that happen to be in there. This is not normally uh, transcribed or spliced region or human genomes. These just happen to be in there, and the cell is recognizing them because they look like what the cell should be sliced. So overall, uh, the naive and uh, genomic, the evolved DNA look very similar. So here are just some stats on uh, the kinds of things breaks uh, of the two. And you can see that the density is pretty much the same. There are both about on average two kb long transcripts. Uh, they are more seldom spliced in naive DNA. Uh, they're also generally rarely spliced in the yeast genome. So I guess not all that surprising that the yeast cell doesn't really like to splice things. Uh, the overall length is roughly the same. The expression level is also pretty close to the same, but you can see there's also this long tail of uh, high expression for evolved transcript, indicating that you can get this basal level of expression very easily, but it really takes selection to get this high expression level. We also uh, looked at uh, transcription on a per base level. So since the strands are arbitrary here, we're just looking at the reads on one strand and the reads on the other strand. And here we put naive DNA in one corner and evolved in the other because the plots would be symmetric. So we just cut it into pizza slices and replaced uh, half the graph for each. And you can see that uh, the naive DNA is expressed on both strands much more often than the evolved DNA. Uh, what is much harder to see, it's down in the corner here, is that the evolved DNA actually has more, uh, more sequence that is not detectively expressed at all. So you can see that if we go back to this original plot here, uh, this is the yeast genomic DNA. And you can see here's a chunk that's not expressed at all. Here's another chunk that's not expressed at all. You can't really find anything similar in the human DNA in yeast. You can see sense and anti-sense expression very often in the human DNA in yeast. And there's very few examples of that. In this case, this is actually an example of a known regulatory anti-sense RNA in yeast. Most of the time, you really don't see much anti-sense expression in yeast. So they look very similar, but have the evolved DNA has been optimized. So next we're going to look at uh, human DNA. And uh, experiments are very hard 
in this case. So what we would really like to do, and we're actually working on this now, is put a huge amount of naive DNA into human cells and see what the human cell is going to do with it. But that is like even 100 kb of naive DNA synthesizing it. That's like a whole postdoc's project for four years. And if you tell that postdoc, okay, here's what we found. You're going to spend four years making 100 kb of this naive DNA. You're going to put it in the cells, and we expect to see nothing. It's not going to do anything because 100 kb of just random genomic intervals in the human genome usually has nothing, no transcripts being produced in that region. So good luck finding a postdoc to do that experiment. And even if they did, you see nothing. Okay, well, that's what we were expecting, but we really need a lot more sequence to really hang our hat on this result. So it's basically not feasible at this point anyway to do the real experiment, but we are working on ways where we can test it in the throughput needed. So instead, we're going to use a computer model. And you can put in as much DNA as your server can handle with a computer model. So in this case, we're using the informer model. Uh, basically, all you need to know about it is that it takes a 200 KB sequence as input, and it's a deep neural network. It predicts many different human and some mouse uh, genomic tracks. These are things like chromatin marks and uh, accessibility. And importantly for us, in our analysis, considering genomic sequences, we're only considering those that are in the test set. So these are not sequences that Informer has been trained on. No training test violations, at least not obvious ones in our analysis. First thing we found is that uh, it is important, according to Informer, to match the dye or trinucleotide content of the sequences, especially in a local way. So if you just give it completely random sequences, so here this is uh, predicting accessibility in embryonic stem cells, you just give it completely random sequences, it's predicting nothing will happen. We don't really know why this is. It could be because Informer has never seen anything that looks like completely random DNA before. It just doesn't know what to do with it. We're probably going to test this by actually putting in random DNA in the cells, but haven't got around to it yet. That if you believe in former, it will have very little to no activity. You can see that even like matching the trinucleotide content, uh, it increases it uh, quite a bit, the amount of activity. And for comparison, this is the genomic, uh, just some locus that we pick. If you do the dinucleotide or trinucleotide shuffling in a local way, so this is now with the sliding window across uh, the genome, doing the shuffling, then you actually recapitulate much more of the activity that you initially saw uh, in the sequence, although it's different locations than the original sequence, but you still get a lot more activity. And this kind of makes sense because uh, our genome is not just completely random. There are mutational biases that actually generated this dinucleotide content, right? And this has to do with like the frequency of different types of mutations, like CPG methylation will result in a EPG um, mutation often. So because of these biases and the fact that the random DNA just doesn't look anything like human DNA, we decided we were going to use this dinucleotide shuffle in a local sliding window as our naive DNA in this experiment. So one thing that occurred to us is that Informer just might be completely wrong, right? We don't want to completely hang our hats on a model that could, it's never seen this naive DNA before, it could be wrong. So we wanted to validate the model's predictions in some way. And in this case, uh, we are doing so using another model on the y-axis here is the predictions of the Sahu model. And this is a model that is trained on random star seed data in humans themselves. So this is a model that's never seen genomic. So it's something about gene regulation because it's been uh, trained on data from this kind of reporter system. But there's no chance of it overfitting the genome because it's never seen genomic sequences. But the two seem to agree with each other. The other thing to know about the SAHU model is it's basically a, a classifier. If it's over 0.5 where the line is, 
predicting that it's going to act, it's going to cause expression to happen and if it's below 0.5, it's predicting it's not. So basically, if an former is predicting its open chromatin, which is over here, then the Sahu model agrees. And it doesn't matter whether it's evolved or naive DNA, they both look the same. Further, if you look at what motifs are enriched in open chromatin, this is predicted open chromatin now, according to the former, you can see that the same motifs are enriched, whether it was genomic DNA or the naive DNA. In this case, we're looking at the pluripotency factors because we're looking at predicted open chromatin in stem cells. And you can see that uh, basically the same factors are enriched in both, although there are a little, a few differences. There's just not a lot of huge differences. And uh, one thing I wanted to mention, there's a point in here, uh, it's not labeled, but it's CTCF. So this is like one of the cases where I thought CTCF has a pretty long time inside. It'd be pretty hard to generate that by chance, but apparently they do occur after you've shuffled the sequences. And when Informer sees them, it will predict that it has turned like that sequence will be open from it. So even in cases like that, it seems like this naive DNA will have uh, activity. So next we wanted to look at uh, how abundant is the activity and what does it look like in a naive DNA. So this is kind of a complex plot and I hope you can see the colors. So on the x-axis is the, the amount of activity predicted by informer. On the right y-axis, is the ratio of evolved to naive, uh, it's actually predicting in bins, so it's the ratio of bins that meet the threshold on the x-axis. And, oh, it's playing the other y-axis in another slide. But basically what you can see is that low levels of activity, uh, they, the naive DNA is outnumbered only a little bit by evolved, but as you get more and more extreme of activity, uh, evolved, now much outnumbers the naive. So it's like the, the same thing we saw in yeast. The basal activity is not that hard to create. The extreme of activity is much harder and we need evolution to get that. This is true for other chromatin marks too. So this is uh, on the left is H3K27 acetylation, which is associated with activation. Again, we see the same kind of trend. Uh, H3K27 methylation, which is associated with repression. Uh, you actually see more of that in the naive DNA, but still at the extremes, you're seeing more in the evolved. So it's like, it's got this basal activity, it's biased towards repression, but you can still see uh, less frequent than this low activity. You can still see occasional high activity sequences, but again, you really need evolution to get to these extremes of activity. Although I did mention that even here, uh, you are still seeing those sequences in the naive DNA. It's just not very common. So uh, next we wanted to see, okay, we want like, we want to get a number of how often this happens. So we, this uh, other y-axis, I'll now explain. This is the fraction of the bins in the genomic DNA that actually correspond to chip peaks. So we're going to call these like the, the true positive rate for the blue curve, for the genomic track. So we can say, okay, at like 80% here, true positive rate, what is the ratio of evolved to naive? In this case, at 80% true positive rate, it's like nine to one, which is fairly abundant in naive DNA. It's still not as much as the genome. If you do this across many cell types and many tracks, you see that uh, it can be variable between the different chromatin marks, but all of them are uh, fairly abundant, I would say, in the naive DNA. It again depends on signal, and some of them are noisier than others. Part of this is because a lot of the chip data that were used uh, both to train and former and also 
to derive this 80% true positive rate. It's not sequenced deep enough. And so there's a lot of peaks that are real, but they didn't sequence deep enough to actually call them real. And those are more abundant in the naive DNA. So we think this is actually an underestimate of how much uh, activity we're going to see. So next, we wanted to address some specific questions that people had hypothesized about uh, for uh, basically the specificity of activity across cell types. So people had hypothesized that why would this linked RNA be expressed in a cell type specific way unless the cell type specificity was itself important? Why would the humans have evolved that specificity? Well, it turns out that that's, that's the default option, the specificity. If you just look at uh, predicted DNA's activity, this is DNA's for naive, this is for evolved, uh, you see less cell type specificity in the naive DNA than in the evolved. So that's actually the default of expectation, a lack or having cell type specificity. We show the same thing for cage here, where we're just looking at uh, track track correlations, and again, the naive DNA has on average lower correlations and therefore is more cell type specific than the evolved. So next we took another look at this hypothesis that uh, chromatin, co chromatin mark co-localization is a sign of selection. So for instance, why would the cell bother to put HDK27 acetylation and H3K4 methylation and open chromatin all in the same spot unless it was important to have all of those in the same spot? Well, it seems like those are just, that's just how the system works. Because whether you're looking at naive or evolved DNA, both of them show the same trend. It's different for every cell type, so hard to see with the labels here, but each of these plots is a different cell type and the, the cell types look different from each other, but within each of the cell types, the correlations between the uh, tracks, whether it's uh, evolved or naive, they look very simple, indicating that this is not a good mark for selection. So the conclusions for this part uh, are that naive DNA appears to be biochemically active. It's, seems to be active in yeast and it's predicted to be active in humans and it looks a lot like evolved DNA. Uh, we found that the extreme of activity is a good marker for a function, but the fact that it's active at all or uh, it's cell type specific or there are co-occurring chromatin marks, those do not appear to be reliable indicators of function. So, how much time we got? Got some time, right? Okay. Uh, so next I wanted to tell you briefly about uh, kind of a new direction. It's not really all that new, but a direction that the lab is currently going in trying to uh, solve the cis regulatory code across all human cell types. Uh, and why learning from the genome is probably not a great idea. Uh, so the first problem with learning from the genome is that there are a very large number of parameters to learn. So if we just consider this one parameter, the interactions of transcription factors as they bind DNA, since any transcription factor can interact with any other and base pair uh, resolution spacing, and they can occur in different orientations, that means we already, just using this one set of parameters, we already have 22 million unknowns to learn. And we don't have enough genomic DNA sequence to actually learn all these features. Most of them, many of these interactions will probably be in the genome once or maybe zero times, and we can't possibly learn it from the genome if that were the case. It has to be in there many times. Another problem is that our genome, as despite being like the haploid genome is like three point something gigabases. It's actually way too short and too repetitive to actually learn all these parameters. So here I'm showing a plot where uh, 
what I did was take random 200 KB sequences and just matched cameras to each other. If the camera was in both of them, it got counted as being shared. If the camera was only in one, it was not shared. In this case, K is 20. So just looking at all possible 20 hertz in the sequences. And you can see that for random sequences, the vast majority have no 20 hertz in common. If you take two random genomic sequences, and these are even from different chromosomes, uh, they share a very large number of sequences, number of chainers, which basically means that models trained on them can actually memorize little bits of the genome without actually learning their function. For instance, all these repeat elements that are throughout the genome, it doesn't have to learn how the line elements work, it can just memorize this is what a line element looks like. And if we want the models to actually understand regulation, we obviously don't want it to just memorize things. But we have this now opportunity with our uh, ability to synthesize DNA. And it means that the genome is going to be an ever decreasing slice of the pie of DNA we measure. So we, we have the genome. We now have the T to T assembly of our genome. And we can measure variation across humans, but basically the amount of DNA is not going to increase any more than what we have already. Whereas this non-genomic DNA, we've already measured more than a human genome is worth of it, and we keep making more. So uh, it makes a lot more sense to kind of turn things around and start training our models on the uh, non-genomic DNA, and then we can test them on the genomic DNA. So me and UC Taipali wrote this paper that hopefully will be out soon, uh, where basically we described this roadmap to solve cis regulation using this approach. And the basic idea is to combine uh, some existing and some non-existing technologies so that we can get really high resolution uh, data of transcription factors binding to DNA for instance, in reporter assays where we test billions of short sequences, but then we have to figure out how to assemble that into longer and longer sequences, eventually at megabase scale, so that we can actually predict the function of the human genome. And we have to do this across many different cell types, all the cell types of the human body. And ultimately, you can then build this kind of model where you take, uh, I don't know if we have to do this, but what would be ideal in my view is to take transcription factor expression as input and DNA sequence. And the model can then spit out the regulation of that sequence given kind of the transcription factor makeup of the cell. And then you have this model that has this thorough understanding of transcriptional regulation and you can use it for fun things like predicting variant effects and uh, designing candidate drugs that will solve the bad effects of those mutations. And with that, let me acknowledge again uh, the people who actually did the work. Uh, in particular, the Dream Challenge was done by uh, Abdul Muntakim Rafi. And uh, I talked about those who did, Sandra and Ishika, who did uh, the vast majority of the work for the random and closed project that I showed you. And uh, we are often hiring people, but in particular, we're looking for people uh, who are interested in IPSC uh, lung engineering, both computational and experimental. So talk to me uh, if you're interested in that, and I'd be happy to take any questions.